Good to go? Yep. Hi, folks. Welcome. This is our Christmas version of the Purple Heart Q&A. What else we call it? Tonight's topic is improving your dovetails. Is that right? Get that right? Yes, we have... It's called dovetails by hand, but Do yes. Dovetails by hand. Okay. So tonight you'll notice our wreaths. I also want to note, in case you don't know what the Purple Heart Project is, I'll give it to you as briefly as I can. COVID willing, six times a year we bring in seven combat wounded veterans from all over the world. We treat them to a very intense hand tool workshop where we teach them how to literally, literally build a piece of furniture with just hand tools. And when I say that, I mean there is no power. We cover airfare, hotel, meals. We send each vet home with approximately $3,500 US worth of premium tools, same stuff that I'm using. And thanks to guys like uh, uh, Jack Lane and Chris Chah Chahosky, we now have what's called the Bench Brigade and every vet will have a bench waiting for him, which is fantastic. It has been the missing link. And uh, I got some shout outs to do tonight for some people that have stepped up to the plate for that. Anyway, so uh, of course it's an expensive venture and we let you participate. This is one of the best things you could possibly do for these heroes that have put everything on the line for us. So if you would like to contribute tonight, you go to our website, the link will be in there, and you can contribute and uh, just feel great about it, especially this holiday season. Got a lot of really good stuff tonight. We've got lots of guests here. Go around the room real quick. Jake's behind the camera. Frick is behind the technology, so if anything goes wrong. Way in the back we have Ken. Ken's gonna be watching. So if you're a combat wounded vet that has been to one of our workshops, would you please let us say hello to you? Just put a note in there that you're a combat wounded vet, that you what class you were in, and we'll give you a shout out. So Ken's going to be watching for that, as well as answering some of the questions. Megan is on that, like a, what's a good analogy of something that's really on something? White on rice? White on rice? Is there just head rice? So she'll watch for it. Now, Bill Bailey, I understand, is in the audience tonight. Bill is a Navy corpsman, Vietnam, and uh, we somehow missed him every time. So, Bill, I salute you. Merry Christmas to you. We also have Rex, who's stuffing his face. Other than that, he's in charge of security. Beside him is, I was going to call him the Silver Fox. I don't know why I said the thought that, but it's a moose. And moose is the, uh, well, I'll tell you why moose is here shortly. And then over there we have Nick and his fiance. Erica, and they're going to be watching this as well. And Luther's on. Super Dave, we're missing tonight. Do we have anybody else on that's helping? So we'll get your questions answered. We'll answer as many as possible. And uh, as we go through the night, I'll tell you a little more about what's going on behind me. And let's go right in and start a question. Nope. Start with a question. Have we got one? Nope. We don't. All right. Well, then while we're digging out questions, we don't even have, a, we don't even have an, uh, one that came in online yet? All right, no, I, well, I'll pick one myself. Yep, give me one. Uh, this one comes from Mike Miller in Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Mike. He says, I know when cutting rip is with the grain and cross cut is across the grain. However, how can you tell the difference between a rip saw and a cross cut saw by looking at them? Saw to you. He puts well, of course, the smaller the teeth. Can somebody go shut off the uh, Yeah, it's quite loud. The air, it's, it's really loud. Here, let's uh, look at it this way because it's easier to see. If you're talking about a dovetail saw, the teeth are going to be so small, it's going to be very hard to see. Jake, you, you can move. So if you look at this, if you look at this, this is a rip tooth. And if you were to look real close, what you're going to be looking at is the face of the tooth. So this part that engages the wood. And the face of that tooth is typically going to be perpendicular to the run of the blade. So if I took a square and put it on there, that tooth, the face of that tooth would be square to the side. Now, just to tell you a little more, if you also look down there, I don't know if you can notice, but it looks like a wiggly line because each tooth has what's called set. If you didn't, if the teeth were in line with the plate, this, this is the saw plate, you wouldn't get in there more than a quarter of an inch and the saw would bind. So what they do is they bend, uh, each tooth gets bent 
one goes this way, the next one goes that way. So that when it cuts through the wood, it makes a groove or a kerf a little wider than the saw plate so that it doesn't jam. Secret to a good saw is not to have too much set. So that's your rip tooth, perpendicular face on the cutting tooth, cutting face. On your cross cut, if you were to put a, you'll notice that those, that same face that we're talking about has a, a, a has a, a slope on it, something like that. And the ones cut this, one slope to this way, the next one is sloped that way, and all the way down the line. Same thing, set, every other tooth is bent. Turn it sideways, I really can't tell. Now, if you were to look, if you were to look down the saw, what you would see on a rip tooth is this. As opposed to a crosscut tooth, you would look and you would actually see a V down there because of the way they, the points stick out. This one, the tooth is cutting straight across. This one, it's actually a three-sided tooth. And all the cutting is done by that little point, which is the reason why these dull so much faster than these. It's not a lot, but this is the cutting face. Uh, this is the cutting edge on a rip tooth. It's the entire width of the blade, whereas on a cross-cut tooth, it literally is a point where three surfaces intersect. All right. Now, they'll both rip and they'll both cross-cut. However, if you try ripping with a cross-cut, it's going to be very slow. If you try cross-cutting with a rip, it's going to be a little bit coarse. Now, I've done this before, and I'll do it again because uh, somebody mentioned that they, they thought it was a good way of describing it. I'm going to take a piece of pine, and here's, a rip, here's how a rip tooth works. So, I'm going, this is, the grain is running this way. When I come in with a rip tooth, and those teeth... Take out chunks of wood. You see how relatively clean it is? But if I do the same thing across the grain with that saw, with that chisel, that uh, rip saw, see how, what a mess it makes? So on a cross cut, instead of having that kind of a disaster, you have these sharp points that are going to go in, and they're going to score. What's it sitting? There's a screw in there, and I don't know why. They're going to score both sides. This is what the points are doing. This is what the points are doing. So the points are going in and scoring both sides. Then when the uh, that chip gets cleaned out, I didn't get that quite wide enough. Let me go a little bit wider. Now when that comes in and makes a cut, I think it's going to work. I don't think you went deep enough. Yeah, I didn't go deep enough, but you get the point. That, that was a little weak, but hopefully you understand. Cross cut and a rip. And they make a combination saw, which does a little bit of both, but it'll never perform as well in the function that it's designed to do. All right, good. Clears mud. Next. Okay. Uh, next one comes from Glenn Habibi. By the way, Merry Christmas, everybody. Hope we say that several times tonight. Glenn Habibi in New York. Hi, Glenn. He says, what's likely going wrong if I'm always ending up with a gap underneath the tails? On the piece that has pins, the space for the tails is too deep, even though I oh, feel... Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up. Back up. You got you to gotta say this slower so I can follow you. <clears throat> what's likely going wrong if I'm always ending up with a gap underneath the tails? Hold, hold. So, here's, a, uh, here's the joint that we cut the other day for a video we're doing on fixing gaps. So, we went through and made mistakes. So, say that again. I'm going to try to envision what he's meaning. Okay. So, what's likely going wrong if I'm always ending up with a gap underneath the tails? And then Gap underneath the tails. So, so, I'm assuming he's either talking about this or... Well, that, that no, could be the only one. That's the only one. Underneath the tails, okay? Yeah. Okay, so in brackets, he puts, on the piece that has pins, the space for the tails is too deep, even though I feel like I hit my marking gauge line accurately. Okay. 
So this is most likely the cause. When you use a marking gauge, now what kind of a marking gauge should they be using, Jake? Well, it depends on which one they prefer. Either a Cosmonized Wood River or a Rob Cosmonized. And is there any reason why they might want to be thinking about marking gauges today? 15% off, baby. There you go. Our friend uh, Abraham Pinsky in, in uh, Israel actually wanted you to, maybe you can say this later, but he wanted to give the differences between your marking gauge and the Cosmonized okay. Wood River. Okay. So when you use a marking gauge, what you're doing is you are taking that surface and you are simply tra uh, transferring it that much lower. So there's your, there's your two marking gauges. Now, marking is left. If that wasn't perfectly square, guess what? Though that from there to there is not going to be perfectly square either. So you have to check to make sure that that is square. If that's out of square and you put your joint together in the process of squaring up the two pieces, you know, you're coming in here to check. In getting that square, if the, two, if the end of the board wasn't, then there's a good chance that your gauge line, when you square this up, is going to open up a gap down through there. That's the most common problem, the reason I see it. The other one is this. People will go in, and they're chopping along that baseline. If you've got a whole bunch of waste uh, left over from the... Uh, if you've got a whole bunch of waste left over, actually, let me just do it rather than draw it out. Grab my saw. Fret saw. Oh yeah, we got a, we got an, uh, a nice gift, compliments of Santa Claus and his wife tonight. Several. People have a real tough time using the fret saw. You gotta put a little bit of time in on that in order to get good at it, but it's, it's not difficult, but it takes a little bit of practice. And they end up leaving, because of fear that they're gonna go below the line, they leave a whole bunch of material here. So this is all waste. If you put your chisel in that gauge line right now and start chopping, there's a tremendous amount of pressure being applied on the bevel side of the chisel. You know, you look at the slope of that chisel, there's gonna be, as a wedging action. Anything on the waist side is gonna push on that bevel, trying to push this chisel back like this. And if that wood is not really hard, if that's a soft wood, there's a good chance you're gonna end up breaching that line and you're going to end up with your baseline down in here somewhere. So what I always do, if you're not good with your fret saw, come in here, and do a couple of chops first to get rid of that waste. Now when you put your chisel in the baseline, there's very little material over here. The chisel gets down into the wood a fair distance before the pressure starts to build up. Well, if you're down in there an eighth of an inch, you've got lots of support preventing that chisel from pushing back this way. So that would be the, probably the lesser of the two reasons why he's having a problem. The, the lesser of the two reasons I gave for the problem you're having the one I suspect the most is, is just your end of your board was not perfectly square. And that'll always throw you off when you, uh, it'll always throw you off when you go to square up your joint. Now, the other thing you want to check too is make sure that your marking gauge cutter is tight. That's not supposed to roll. That's fixed. Now, Rex, grab me a cosmonized, oh, never mind, right here. Grab me uh, one of mine, please. Yep. The, the black ones. I'll, I'll, when he comes back, we'll talk about that. So, just wanted to tell you real quick, and I'll say it several times tonight, for every uh, Santa Claus, which ha that story has to be told here soon, too. It's a good night to do it. Uh, Santa Claus came into my life um, five years ago. Just an email out of nowhere. And uh, said, I really like what you're doing. And he said, I just sent you $1,500, and if you want, why don't you just give away some tools? Pay, I pay, I'll, I'll cover the cost, full retail. This isn't going to cost you anything. Anyway, the check cleared the bank, and I thought, wow. So we started just doing, doing a draw once a week. We would give away three or $400 worth of tools on our online workshop. And uh, 
that led to him uh, providing providing an opportunity for five people to come to our summer workshop. Then he stepped in and helped me with Jesse, and we and then the whole Purple Heart project took off. So Santa Claus has been a huge part of this. Well, he contacted me again just a few months ago and said, "Rob, I've been very sick, but I'm back on I'm back in the uh, back in the, among the living," and he wanted to volunteer to pay for the prizes that we give away every time we do this. And we give away thousands of dollars. So tonight, we're giving away, we're going to call it a dovetail support kit. Thank you. And the dovetail support kit includes all the stuff you see right here. Two cosmetized marking gauges, fret saw with blades, two, two pair of dividers, the dovetail, uh, hand cut dovetail book, and we'll all sign it for you. Dovetail marking knife with a sawtooth blade. The dovetail trainer to help you improve your ability to saw. If you don't know what this is, this fits on the end of your saw. And that little bubble level, set at whatever you have, will help you determine where zero is or 10 degrees to the left or 10 degrees to the right. So it's great for helping you develop that feel. The three different videos I've done on cutting dovetails. So I think the value of that was 400 and something. We'll give away one of those kits at every $1,000 increment we get tonight in donations. So if you want to be a part of that, all you have to do is, is there a link on there, Frick? Yes, there is. I'll post it now. Again. Yep. It doesn't cost you a nickel. Just go in there and, and uh, say, yep, throw me into the, throw my name in the hat. We've got some other prizes. I'm going to space it out, how we talk about it tonight. And I uh, will cover that shortly. Next question. All right. So two questions related to the same topic, both uh, regarding inlay dovetails. Um, Scott Hobbs from Westchester, Iowa. Inlay dovetails? Inlaid dovetails. Do you know what those are? No. Nope. But he asked the question. It might well, just be a terminology thing. Scott wants to know, do you like making inlaid dovetails and Ali Asawad in Australia says how do you cut an inlay dovetail well gentlemen I'm, I'm not quite sure of your terminology so when you say inlaid dovetails pardon you're talking about a uh, yeah, Oh, is that something like the, they they do with that Inkra jig? Uh, no, you do, you do by hand. Well, you find it. Get, show me a picture, Nick, and I'll uh, and then I'll address it. I have to make that one up. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Frick. We'll All come right. back to that. Uh, Cliff Pollock in Ithaca, New York. Hey, Cliff. Says, do you ever dry fit your dovetails before gluing? I am awed at your courage to just apply glue and assume <laughs> it will go together as planned. Awed at my courage. <laughs> Never, never, only once in a while. Uh, the idea is, no, we don't dry fit. I'm, let me just, oh, okay, now I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I've only ever done that once. And uh, where is it? I did it on a clock that I made, and I did it because I screwed up. And it was a, that was a dovetail from a long time ago. So I went in, and I inlaid with, uh, with maple veneer on a walnut dovetail all the way around it. Ah, uh, you know what? Maybe I'm getting too old, but I'm kind of past that. I, I'm 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 more for the subtle, the stuff that ju that jumps out at you used to attract my attention, but now it's almost like it's too in your face. So I prefer something like this. There's cherry on cherry, and I just it's there. You see it, and the closer you look, the more you appreciate it. But it's not. It's not uh, quite so in your face. So I wouldn't say that I'm a big fan of uh, what you're calling an inlaid dovetail. Do it if you want. Let me answer the question about the marking gauge. So here are the two different marking gauges that we offer. Well, there's not two, there's several. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the Wood River. And the Wood River is, uh, as it comes, is not ready to be used. So we, uh, we cosmonize it. Um, it's got a different, uh, it's got a calibrated rod on there, but I, I've never known anybody to actually use that. The cutter doesn't come sharp. So we go in and we sharpen the cutter. We cut a little recess, so it'll sit down in there. We flatten the head. 
We also put a flat spot on there so it doesn't roll off. We glue it together so that it doesn't come apart because it's notoriously com comes apart. The sharpening of the cutter is probably the biggest advantage. On the cosmonized one, we turn these over there on the lathe by hand, believe it or not. That's the same material that we use. That's the same material that we use on the uh, on the dovetail saw. We use we have our own cutters made, and these are half inch with a little more robust. If you notice that the cutter on the Wood River, it's um, it's quite acute, and it's almost it's okay for soft wood, but you get into hardwood, and it's easy to break and chip. So we we have uh, Paul, my buddy up in Ontario, makes these for us and hardens them. And it's a lot more, it's a much more robust cutter. It'll stand a fair bit of abuse, easy to sharpen, and just works great. So, one's the difference is uh, we make one here and the other one we just modify here. Pardon? Oh, well, let's get them. Let's get them. You don't have a microphone? I'll show you over here. We'll do it after the next question. Okay. Next question. Okay. Uh, I have a guest. <laughs> okay. So next question comes from uh, Richard in New Jersey. When making a through dovetail, drawer, or box, should the pins or tails be visible from the front? Oh, well, you know, just to make sure I'm answering that properly, say it again, please. <laughs> Richard, New Jersey, when making a through dovetail or box, should the pins or tails be visible from the front? Well, you know what? There, there is no answer to that one. There's no right or wrong. You can do whatever you want. I, I prefer to, you, to put the tails so that you see them from the most visible side. So if you look at any of these boxes that I've done up in here, without any exception, they always have the tails. The tails are visible from the front. And in case you're not catching on to what I mean, here you're looking at the ends of the pins, the ends of the tails. Over here, you're looking at the tail themselves. So this would typically be the side that I would put that you show on the front of your, drawer, of your, of your box. By the way, this, I'll just uh, take you through this real quick. We finally finished this. It's an absolute thrill to do. We just did a video that'll be uploaded on YouTube tonight. No. No? no? Monday? No. Tuesday. Tuesday? Monday or Tuesday. And, and it's on this, uh, it, it goes through all of this, and I give you all the details and all the inner workings. If you haven't seen this before, sh show them the one feature. Are we in nursery tonight? <laughs> Bye. So this is a standing desk, and the whole idea was to have all the drawers hidden from view, hidden in plain sight. So there's a little trap door underneath here, and you pull the trap door open, allows you to put your finger up in and open the drawer. And then if you want your customer to get a pen, you close the trap door, which creates a seal in there, and when you close this, that little door pops out, and there's the customer's pens and pencils. And it's the same thing on this side, and in here, you have three drawers, again, hidden in plain view, but you reach up underneath, and there's a little hole right here that allows you to put your finger up in, and there's a little wooden V on the underside of the drawer, and that's how you access it. So we're giving this away tonight to somebody lucky. He's going to... I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, right. Last time I did something like that, Jake almost... Had an accident. Okay, next. Megan, are you ready? Yeah. Oh, yes, let's have some vets. Uh, is your mic on? It's on in my end. Can you hear me? Megan, one, two, three. You say it and I'll repeat it while they're playing, figuring it out. Um, no, no, just a sec. Right now? Mark. Yeah, Megan, is your mic on? It is. Yes. yes. Mark Smith. Um, he's on too, but Mark, Mark T. Pardon? Mark T. Mark T. Mm. Oh, just the initial? I'll go back and find it. I okay. didn't write his last name where he only had a T, initial T. Um, Sean McDermott. Hey, Sean. I just talked to Sean. Merry Christmas, brother. Mark T. Oliver. Mark Oliver. 
So I'm gonna show you about Mark Oliver. Mark gave me my very first. Far left. My very first challenge coin. That was it, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what they were. So Mark, I keep it right there on my bench. And if you don't know what a challenge coin is, they're a military thing. I can't give you a really good, ex uh, a really good uh, definition, but I've had several given to me and I appreciate them very much. Merry Christmas, Mark. Who else? Um, okay, so Mark Oliver, Sean McDermott, Philip Lawrence. Hey, Philip. How do? Merry Christmas. Jake Tarola. Jake, brother, where are you? So, smells like moose, this jersey. So, uh, let me just explain this real quick. So, we, uh, we uh, play a fair bit of hockey up here. What else is there to do in the Canadian winter? Spring, summer, and fall. And uh, we decided so that these guys would know that they were never going to be forgotten. We had jerseys done. Purple Heart Project, logo on the front, and uh, I sponsor it, and uh, another friend of mine uh, that we play with sponsors it as well. And then each jersey has the name of one of our previous vets on there. Now, a lot of the jerseys have been already handed out to the guys that play, but these are some of the ones that we still have. And this is, this is Moose's, but I asked him to bring it in tonight. So this is um, Staff Sergeant Jake Tarola, who was a uh, forward observer, lives in Minnesota, and came out and played with us twice while he was here. Happened to mention that he liked to play hockey. He's actually a goalie, but he did pretty good playing forward too. So I'll uh, mention some of these names as, I, as we uh, hear from them tonight. Um, Jake, uh, Gary Burnett. Hey, Gary. Gary's always on. Where, yes, who's got Gary? Gary? I saw the, I saw his Gary's jersey the other day. I, um, hopefully, I sent you a picture of the guy wearing your jersey. Uh, Pete. Pete. Pete Ambrose. Pete doesn't need a last name. And he his question is: Can Pete make a dovetail? <laughs> well, let me see. So uh, I got to tell you about Pete Ambrose. Pete Ambrose has a spot in my heart that will never go away. Pete is a world, uh, is a, uh, sorry, I was going to say World War II. Pete is a Vietnam vet who also fought, uh, stayed in the military and fought in the first Gulf War. And when he came to our class, he was uh, very quiet, very shy. And um, yeah, we had some. We had some interesting moments. Anyway. <laughs> Pete was, uh, every time I'd go down, Pete would be doing something, and he wasn't quite doing it right. And I'd try to tell him something, and he'd say, no, 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 no. He said, I got it, I got it, I got it, I'm just practicing. I'm going to get this miter. So about a year later, this showed up in my uh, mailbox, and it was, uh, it came with a fair bit of fanfare. There were lights attached. <laughs> there was a card and lights. You open it up, so you had to get this. So you open up the box. And there's a card, and as soon as you open the card, it starts playing Star Wars music. So as you dig down a little deeper, and it's got all these electric lights on it, you find this, uh, you find this dovetail, or as he say, miter, that he had made with some strategically placed flags, they, and a very interestingly shaped dovetail. So we keep that close by for whenever I need pointers. Pete Ambrose from Louisiana, Alabama. Sorry, Louisiana. No, Mississippi. Mississippi. I got to, I knew it was that area. One of the 50 states. Yep, one of the 50 states. Uh, Joe <laughs> no, Bright. Lowest Soon lowest to be 52. Sure. What's that? Joe Bright. Joe Bright. Joe, you got my message. Good, brother. Pete, Merry Christmas, brother. And Joe, so right here right. is, right. where are you? Joseph Bright. Good man. Joseph Bright was my right-hand man in helping Jesse, and I will never forget that. Good man. Merry Christmas, Joe. Kevin Smith. Also a hero. I read his commendation, how he, uh, how he got severely injured saving a group of soldiers. Yep, who else? Kevin Smira. Kevin Smira. Brother Kev. Kevin is, Kevin's right here. Staff Sergeant Smira. Kevin's a good guy. Also, this is Kevin's flag. That he gave me. Where's the flag, Jake? Oh, it's up underneath there. Well, you can't see it because we got all these and things. But anyway, Kevin's flag that day. I know he flew, he traveled with him a lot. So, Merry Christmas, Kev. Ray. Cool Ray. Cool Ray. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So Ray is just uh, salt of the earth. Ray is from Louisiana. <laughs> He's a Cajun. And Ray was, uh, was Vietnam. And Ray, Ray, oh, are you telling me I'm going too long? All right, all right. Save some of them. We'll come back. what Luther's saying. Ray drove, what's it called? A mule. A mule. So if you don't know what a mule is, go and look it up on Kijiji, on uh, whatever, where do you look things up? Kijiji. Google. Google. Kijiji. <laughs> Kijiji. Buy yourself a mule. Go to Kijiji and look up Vietnam era mule. It was a, it was a coolest looking little thing. He means Google. Yeah, I mean Google. And I still can, I can never get that picture out of my mind of, of Ray driving his mule down the road while the, while the mine sweepers are going up the same hill, clearing mines, and he's coming down through it. Yeah, just follow my tracks. And then, and I'll Merry talk Christmas, there, Ray. Mark's on. Mark? Mark Smith. Mark Smith. Hey, brother. You haven't seen you in a while. Come down. And Mark Smith is right here, front and center. Mark's Canadian vet. Okay, question. Oh, time ready? Okay, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to introduce this, but I'll be very, I'll be very non-specific. Um, ever, yeah. Uh, we are lucky to still have some of the greatest generation with us. So we decided back a couple of months ago that we would dedicate the area, the time before and after Remembrance Day, Memorial Day, towards honoring these, uh, these surviving heroes of World War II. And we were lucky enough to find a couple that were still alive. And uh, we, I, I don't know if Herman is on tonight, but if you saw Luther's documentary on Herman, you saw something that was fantastic. And the fact that he was on, we were able to communicate with them. So Luther has put together another documentary. I won't say anything more other than watch it, enjoy it, and we'll talk as soon as it's over. Are you ready to go? Okay, I want to get over where I can see it too. Here at Rob Cosman Woodworking, we make it our mission to honor the men and women of the armed forces, past and present. We are particularly proud to honor those who served in World War II. We call them the greatest generation. Tonight, we want to take a moment to honor all servicemen by telling the story of a few of the greatest generation who served in the 717th Bomber Squadron of the 449th Bomber Group. Casper and Elizabeth Harris lived in New Jersey and were raising their five children when America entered World War II. Four of their children would join the military and serve the nation in its time of need. In 1941, on the eve of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Rob Harris was graduating from the Casey Jones School of Aeronautics as a government certified aircraft mechanic. A year later, Bob was drafted into the Army and was an obvious selection for the rapidly growing Army Air Corps. Bob reported to Davis Montham Field, Arizona for crew training in America's newest bomber, the B-24 Liberator. Compared to the B-17, the B-24 had a longer range, a higher top speed, a heavier bomb load, and a quantum leap in wing design and performance. With approximately 18,500 units built, the B-24 holds the record as the world's most produced bomber and America's most produced aircraft. Used extensively in World War II, it served with American and Allied Air Forces and saw use in every theater of operations. The B-24 was less comfortable than the B-17 since it was produced during wartime and creature comforts were exchanged for production speed. Idle gunners had to sit on the floor. It was also colder and spot heaters were inadequate. Drafts seemed to be everywhere. Moving around the inside of the B-24 was awkward when wearing full gear and jarring collisions were often encountered with aircraft structures and equipment. Nevertheless, the B-24 with a trained crew was a deadly weapon capable of delivering twice as many bombs on target as a B-17. A bomber crewman was an incredibly dangerous job in World War II. Crews had a 71% chance of being shot down and killed or captured. By the end of the war, 
over 100,000 American bomber crews paid the ultimate price. In Arizona, Bob trained as a tail gunner. The tail gunner manned two 50 cal machine guns in a rotating turret at the rear of the aircraft. The turret was extremely cramped, especially when the entrance door was closed. The tail gunner was the lookout defending his aircraft from enemy fighter attack from the rear and warning the crew when the enemy was approaching. The tail gunner position was especially vulnerable with the average combat lifespan being two weeks. In October of 1943, Bob was transferred to the Bruning Army Airfield, Nebraska, where he joined the newly formed 717th Bomb Squadron and was assigned to First Lieutenant Al Morton's crew in the B-24 named Shack Happy. Bob is circled in white in this picture. Bob and the crew of Shack Happy, along with the rest of the squadron, conducted advanced training in formation flying and precision bombing before shipping overseas. In December of 1943, the 717th Bomb Squadron flew from Nebraska to its combat station at Grotigali Airfield in southern Italy. It was a muddy, bombed out Italian Air Force field taken over by the Americans after we had invaded Italy. By early January 1944, the 717th Bomb Squadron was flying strategic bombing missions throughout southern Europe as indicated by the red line. The 717th attacked the Ploesti oil fields, communication centers, aircraft factories, and industrial facilities in Italy, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Albania, and Greece. On 5 May 1944, the briefing officer announced the mission, the Ploesti oil refineries. The area bristled with anti-aircraft guns and was swarming with German fighter planes. The 717th had already made two god-awful missions over Ploesti. This was Shack Happy's 40th combat mission. Only 10 more missions and they could go home. But first, they had to make it through Ploesti again. Shack Happy was the lead bomber flying at 23,000 feet and things started heating up as they made their final approach to the target. Flak from anti-aircraft guns on the ground filled the sky with deadly black puffs of smoke. A Focke-Wulf 109 fighter dove out of the sun with its twin machine guns and four 20 millimeter cannons blazing away. Shack Happy was one of the first bombers hit. They lost rudder control and they couldn't stay in formation. Once out of the formation, German fighters moved in for the kill. One fighter was so close to the rear that Bob could see the smoke from its gun as Shack Happy's metal skin began peeling away in sheets from the pounding they were taking. The power in Bob's turret was out, so he couldn't shoot at the German fighters. He tried cranking the guns up by hand, but it was useless. One of the waste gunners and the ball turret gunner had already been killed, and when Bob looked back, the whole inside of the plane was on fire. Bob got out of his turret, grabbed his parachute, ran through the flames, jumped through the escape hatch in the floor, and pulled his ripcord. While on the way down, the radio operator and Bob were strafed by German fighters, but they missed. Bob, his crew, and 1,500 other POWs ended up in a school in Bucharest converted to a prison. For the next four months, they suffered through Allied bombings that pulverized the city day and night. They lived on daily rations of a chunk of brown bread in the morning and a bowl of cabbage or potato soup at night. In August 1944, the Romanians switched allegiances and came over to the Allied side. Bob and his fellow prisoners immediately were caught between the Germans and the Romanians. Lieutenant Colonel James Gunn, the senior POW, convinced a Romanian Air Force captain to fly him to Italy to arrange a rescue. A short time later, a massive flight of American B-17 bombers, accompanied by dozens of P-51 fighters, flew to Romania to rescue the POWs. In groups of 21, 
the former prisoners were crammed into the bomb bays of the B-17s for their final ride to freedom. Following his rescue, Colonel Thomas, the commander of the 449 Bomber Group, presents Bob with an air medal and his second Purple Heart for his service. The war was over for Bob and the Army rotated him back to the States. All the Harris kids survived the war and were reunited. Bob's older brother, Edward, an infantryman, was taken prisoner at the Battle of the Bulge and also served as a POW. The following is an excerpt from a letter the POWs received from Major General Tweening on 4 September 1944, immediately following their rescue. Dear Sergeant Harris, you're going home. With you will go the thanks and admiration of the 15th Air Force for a superb and heroic performance. You are returning heroes of the Battle of Ploesti. You will be greeted and treated as such by your loved ones and by a grateful American public. They are proud of you. Your safe return to my command marks the culmination of an outstanding campaign in the annals of American military history. Bob? They're talking to you. Yes. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. It's an honor to be in your presence. That's just it. That's just it. You did it. How are you? Was that the delay? What do we need him to do? Shut it. Denise, if you can, uh, Denise, if you can pause the live stream on your end. We're getting, a, we're getting a second feed. It is. Yep. Thank you. Better communications than you had, Bob. Can you hear him? Uh, just, uh, you talked. Uh, talk to you. I said this is a little better communications than you had up in that airplane. Are you spending any, do you get to spend any time in your shop? Every day. Good, that's therapy. That's what keeps you young. Yeah. I can tell. He just finished a tabletop shuffleboard four feet long. He's working on six tractor trailers, trucks, and a bunch of other Christmas gifts. Well, Merry Christmas to a whole bunch of people. Yep. <laughs> well, Bob, I, I, in behalf of everybody that's uh, on here and watching tonight, I want to offer you our heartfelt thanks for what you did. There's no way we could ever repay you or your, your fellow airmen and the soldiers and sailors that participated. But 
Wow, what a contribution you made. Such a privilege to be able to talk to you. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think the ones that deserve all the... All the... Uh, That's amazing. Are the ones that didn't come back. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. I agree, but you know that's uh, the terrible tragedy of war is that not everybody does. But you all went over knowing the same possible end result. But so so good so good to have you with us. Suppose there's any chance you'll get up here to my shop. No, nobody does right now. He's on your YouTube show practically every day. Well, I'll, I will keep that in mind as we go forward. So you'll hear a shout out from me more than once. <laughs> now that I know you're paying attention. I, I want to take a second to thank Colonel Luther, retired Colonel Luther Sheely, who put that together. He does an incredible job on that. Yeah, he deserves a lot of thanks. I was wondering where he got all the information. <laughs> He's fine. He's a, uh, he leaves no stone unturned. <laughs> He's, uh, he, he was, uh, he was uh, U.S. Army artillery. They're a particular breed. <laughs> well, uh, listen, Bob... In, in, have you got any question that you want answered tonight as far as dovetails go? <laughs> it surprised me to see, a, see the pictures of my mother and father on there. I, I thought he got into the house here somehow. <laughs> well, <laughs> check, we, check we under your covers better. before you crawl in bed tonight. <laughs> <laughs> He's thorough. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. I, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and your family too. Hopefully, hopefully this won't be the last time we chat. All the folks there, yeah. yeah. All right, enjoy the show. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. So, I got uh, I got a request. I want you to do me a favor. And I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on you. And I'm, when I say you, I mean everybody watching. How many people do we have on tonight? Right now? 677. 677 people. I'm counting. So if you have benefited from all of these YouTubes that we do and these things, and uh, you feel that you owe me anything at all for providing you that information, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pay me back. Here's what I want you to do. Megan, where are the cards? Where are the cards? <coughs> bring, bring them, open them up, please. What I want you to do, now, can we post these? We got to post this now. Did we, did we get the address? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to do two things. I'm going to ask you in the next day or two to uh, write a Christmas card with a little special note inside. Hand out everybody two cards, please. And in that card, I want you to send a card to Bob and his wife. And I want you to take the opportunity to just express your thanks. This is a World War II vet. I also want you to do the same thing for Herman. And if you don't know who Herman is, you need to go back and watch our episode. Could you be a little quieter, please? Watch our episode that we filmed. What was the date? October. Ken, can you find me the date on that? It was the... I think it was the wood hinge. These are two uh, living World War II heroes, and they deserve a Christmas card from us to show our appreciation. So please send them a card with a note. We're going to put their addresses on there so that you'll have it. Should I put, put them in the comments? Yep, put them in the comments section, please. And everybody here tonight is going to do, is going to do a card for each of them and, and put that out. And then if you will just... In fact, I want you to go one step further because I'm I, I got to hold you to this task. If you're commit to do it, would you put it in the comments tonight and say I with your name will send each of these heroes 
a Christmas card. And Herman in particular, his 19th or 20th Christmas, he spent as a POW. Now, when what Bob was rest, Bob didn't spend Christmas because he was rescued 14th of November? No, they, no, that's the, that's the, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So the 14th of November, so if you go on YouTube, I don't know if we can, can we leave a link to that? Who has Bob's address? Uh, we can, but she already pasted the address. So, no, no, no. Oh, you want to see the video? The video, yeah. the video of Herman. I can do that. If we can put the link in there. Okay, so Bob, we need your address, or Bob's wife. Would somebody please, in the comment section, put your mailing address so we can flood your mailbox with Christmas cards from an appreciative public? And I don't care what country you're from. If you're living free today, you owe part of that to these gentlemen. So please join me. Yes. And we put this we put this call out on Instagram and Facebook um, earlier in the week. Um, Larry Christensen. Some of them don't have names; they just have Instagram handles. Okay. So I want to give a shout out to Larry Christensen, Chris Dillinger. Uh, some of these are, are, what do they call those? Instagram handles. Instagram handles. Dave Kemp, William Mont Mort. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to yeah, read it. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> I'm going to ask Megan to read it because she wrote it. So these people. So I, I want to see that. I really want to see that comment section jammed, please, with people that say, Rob, I will send each of those gentlemen a Christmas card. Please. Adam Terrell. Adam Terrell. William Moritz. William Morris. There was an MSA worker. That was an MSA in worker. Instagram handle. And then a Vorak Furniture. Vorak Furniture. You know who you are. So just give me a, get me posted on how many people are saying, yes, I will do it. Okay, next question, Frick. All right, this question. Oh, my camera is frozen. All right, they don't get to see me. Uh, this next question is from Dan Vasquez in New Jersey, and he's wondering, are dovetail chisels important to the process? Are dovetail chisels. Now, when he says a dovetail chisel, some people call a half-blind, uh, pardon me, a beveled-edge chisel a dovetail chisel. So I'm going to answer this question in two ways. If you're referring to this as a dovetail chisel, and it's, it's called that because the slope on the side or the bevel on the beveled edge chisel is designed to allow you to get in between the two tails without bruising the side of them. So absolutely. If you're talking about a half blind dovetail, which is this that we make here in the shop, that's a chisel that allows you to get into, if you can imagine a half blind where you don't get full access. Now when you're, when you're chopping out this area right here where the tail's gonna sit, you've gotta be able to get into those corners. And you can't do it with a, a regular chisel because the regular chisel is gonna hit the two sides before it gets into the corner. We make these half blind chisels that are sharp on the side as well. And I would not cut a dovetail without it. It's that, it's that advantageous. And by the way, if you're looking at that dovetail and say, Rob really, really lost it. Frick, cut that one. Yeah, frick. This one was done like that on purpose so that we could show you how to make repairs. He could be referring, I know Blue Spruce makes dovetail chisels and they're just a, they're a. Just a beveled edge. No, they're oh. a skinnier chisel. Yeah. Regular beveled edge chisels. My recommendation are IBC, first choice, Wood River, second choice. How many people have said, yes, I will send a... A lot. Uh, good. Keep it going, brothers. I appreciate it. Uh, I shouldn't sisters. say brothers. And sisters, yes. I did. And oh, Bob's me. address was also posted. Pardon? Bob's address was also posted. And Bob's address is on there. Please, I want you to flood them with Christmas cards. Show your support. I think this is awesome. You guys all done your cards yet? Do you need a pen? Do you have a pen? Okay, pass it around, would you please? I actually already took them to the post office. I have lots of pens. You did? <laughs> Here's your pens. Bob oh, and Herman. Open the drawer. There's two Bob really and nice Herm pens. Uh, Bob and Herman need to hear from you. A card for open each. Open that drawer. I will mail it. You put it in the envelope. I'll take care of the stamp. 
Wow, the generosity floweth. <laughs> it's got to happen. It has to happen. These have to know. We we may not have many more Christmases left where we get to celebrate this way. Right, Ken? Right. Now, Ken's father-in-law that you've heard if you watched our, all our episodes, his father-in-law fought in Battle of the Bulge. Moose's father, speaking of tail gunners, Moose's father flew in a Lancaster, and he operated the gun that was in the midships up top. And he took some shrapnel from that. And, listen to this, Erica, way over there, Erica's grandfather, who is still alive, how old is he? 95. 95, and where did he, you don't know. He was in World War II, but he's never talked about it. And we are trying to see if we can't get through to him, because I think that would be awesome. Imagine if we had him here. Wow. That would be incredible. And Frick's grandfather was in World War II as well. I had a grand uncle that was in World War II. My grandfather was a farmer, which were considered essential workers. Okay, next question. All right, next question comes from Vinny Izzo in Kingston, New York. And he says, can I use a quality tenon saw for dovetails? Vinny in New York, yes, you can. By a quality tenon saw, I'm sure you mean a Cosman tenon saw, so... Yes. Now, the only, the only distant diff disadvantage is this. Um, it's a rip tooth, narrow set, so it has everything that all the qualities you want a dovetail saw. The difference is the, uh, it's a heavier, bigger saw. It's also, a, there's a greater depth from the tooth line up here to the heavy brass back. So if you don't do this a lot, you get a little bit of instability that way. If you consider that most dovetails are cut in three-quarter inch stock or less, you don't need a whole lot of depth of cut. The closer your tooth line is to that supporting brass back, the more stability you have. So that's the reason why <coughs> dovetail saws are the size that they are. Although some were actually made fairly deep, which I don't understand because you're never cutting that kind of depth with a little saw like that. But yes, you can use a tenon saw. The tooth count as well. Tooth count, yeah, the tooth count's a little uh, coarser too. That's a 12 TPI, whereas the dovetail saw is 15 TPI. So you're going to have, it's, it's going to be a little more aggressive. But you know what, if you're good at it, well, let, me, let me just show you here. We'll put a piece of um, 5 8 inch pine in there, and I'll come in and I will cut, I'll cut a tail with the dovetail saw. And then we'll use the medium tenon. Oh, pardon? Ken, are you on that? They're asking for Andy's address. Can you get that, Ken? Oh, they're in the Christmas card mood. Incredible. Wonderful. Just so everyone's aware, Christmas cards are on sale at Costco. You need a whole bunch. <laughs> so, yes, you can use, you can use both saws. You're just going to have a little, you're going to benefit from more control with the regular dovetail saw as opposed to a tenon, but you can do it. Yeah, how the, are we getting flooded with people saying? Okay, let's go back and say hello to a few more vets. Do we have some more than there? Yes, we do. Um, Brian Klinkham. Oh! Klink <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> oh, so I had a great conversation today. I called, I called um, a customer. I call customers. That, uh, that purchased from us. I just feel I owe it to them to say thank you. So this guy's name was Clinkhammer. And I thought, there's got to be a history behind, behind that. So uh, I called Brian, called Brian up, said thank you, and we got chatting. And his father was in Vietnam, and he was a major. And his brother served, just retired not that long ago, and he uh, rose to uh, um, a... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel? No, Colonel. And, uh, of course, if your name was, if you're in the U.S. Army, and you're a colonel, and your last name was Clinkhammer, what do you suppose everybody called you? They're too young. Colonel Clink. Colonel Clink of, the, of uh, Hogan's Heroes fame. So I had a good laugh over that, and I called Luther to see if they made you know him. But anyway, so um, how do you do? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Glad you made it on. All right, next question. Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie's on? Charlie, Charlie Ray? Hi, Charlie. Merry Christmas, brother. Who else? Bob. Bob Abbott. Bob Abbott. Robert. Glad you got your uh, heating problem solved. Now you'll have an even warmer, merrier Christmas. Devin Wright. 
Devin Wright, John? I just talked to Devin earlier. Have Devin. Thank you. Have a Merry Christmas. And he and his wife are both... Oh, I probably shouldn't say that. Anyway, uh, all the best to you. Everything will be fine. Um, Joshua Brand? Brian? Oh, J- Josh Brian? Brand. Yeah. yeah, really? Josh? Hey, brother. Good to have... Josh is a Canadian artillery combat wounded vet from British Columbia who just got his bench a couple of weeks ago delivered by... A couple of guys in Alberta that drove eight hours each way to deliver it, which I thought was just fantastic. But And Josh has a new baby in his life, he and his wife. I hope everything is wonderful. And Kevin Burris. Kevin. Kev, brother, how are you? Kev is a uh, combat wounded vet. Kev was uh, EOD, ex- stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal. So their job were to disarm bombs. And uh, Kevin experienced more than one blast that went a little awry. And anyway, Kevin, uh, great guy, super guy. Kevin brought this to our attention, which happened to be our number one selling item so far this year. This is our uh, our uh, plain wax. We call it the Rob Cosman's Magic Wax. And Kevin's the one that introduced us to us. So I, I said thanks to him before, but I'll say him thanks to him again. Merry Christmas, Kev, you and your wife. Anybody else? Next question. There for was a Chris Mormack that was a disabled vet that can. Chris Mormack? I don't. I don't call that name. Was he in our class? I don't know. Ken had the name written down. No. He wasn't in the class. no. Just a Merry Christmas, Chris. Go ahead, Frick. Next question. All right. This next one comes from T.J. Leonard in Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, T.J. He said, should you start making dovetails with a guide, then go freehand, or is it better to just start learning freehand and not use a guide? Did I hear guide? <laughs> what? No guide. No guide. Learn to do it right. Do it right from the first. By the way, somebody asked me about uh, dry fitting too, test fitting, so I want to address that too. If you, can, if you have the de- manual dexterity to tie your shoes and you have the interest, you can cut dovetails. Let me just take you on a quick little tour. Oh, shoot, I can't, sorry. They're up in there behind the jerseys. But I, uh, I teach hundreds, thousands of people to do this. I think our oldest student we ever had was 88 or 89 out in, uh, out in Boise, Idaho. His name was Bob, and uh, he did it. Anybody can do it. No guides, just do it. Just follow my advice. Follow the video we did. We produce hundreds of them on cutting dovetails. You cannot go wrong, but you have to have the right saw. Let me address that. I'll tell you real quick. So when it comes to cutting a dovetail, what you're trying to do is get as perfect a joint as possible. And what I mean is where two pieces of wood come together. So it's all about your saw. And I've often said 70% of your ability to cut a dovetail is the saw you're using. Will that saw... A, cut straight. Now, here's what's so important about straight. Straight simply is defined as the shortest distance between two points. That has nothing to do with angle. If a cut is made that is straight, it will produce two flat surfaces. So you take your saw and you make a cut. Go down as far as the saw will allow. Then take that piece, put it on its side, and cut that piece off. Okay. If you have a good saw... When you put it back together, the joint will be hidden. See that? Spin it around so we're not matching um, grooves. You see how well that fits? So you have two flat, smooth surfaces. If your saw doesn't do that, and you now have to come in with a chisel and try to clean that up, pair it, is what the word is, your chance of success rapidly decline you need to have a saw that will produce two flat surfaces so when the pit side of the tail and the side of the pin come together you get a good glue joint 70 percent of your ability to do that is right there it has nothing to do with you megan have you ever used a dovetail saw no. you wouldn't lie to anybody would you would you come here please so i'm going to ask megan to come up has never used a dovetail saw. I can't believe Jake's louder to go that long. Has Jake ever used a dovetail saw? <laughs> so you know three-finger open pistol grip, Super right? challenge you to say that. No, it's not on. Three-finger. I know, but one second. Like that. Okay. She's okay. an American. She wouldn't know how to hold a gun. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Better than you. Okay, make a cut somewhere right about there. Use your other finger to help support it. 
Go down about, uh, oh, about an inch. Oh. You can use more of the saw, I meaning you can come all the way to the handle. There you go. Keep going, keep going. A little farther. That's good, that's good, perfect. Thank you. Now, what did I just say? How did I, how did I define straight? I didn't even listen, I don't know. <laughs> and she wasn't paying attention either. Shortest distance between, this is a perfect uh, candidate. Shortest distance between two points. So I'm gonna put a straight edge on there and you tell me, did that cut you make, is it straight? Yes. Yes, perfectly straight. We Thank you. We couldn't see it on the camera. You couldn't see it? Oh, here. Look at that line. Okay, so there's my straight edge. There's the saw cut that she just made while not paying attention. And you see, it's perfectly straight. So if your saw will do that in the hands of a professional or an amateur or a novice, then all you have to learn to do is to aim it. You've got to get it going in the right direction, but you don't have to worry about providing a nice straight cut. The saw does that by itself. Listen, we don't need to sell any more of these. We're tapped out now as it is trying to keep up with it. But if you want one, we'll gladly make it for you. When you decide that you want to be good at dovetails, get my saw and get on with it. And in, in less than a week, you'll be cutting a dovetail that you would not have thought possible. Now we take it a lot farther than that. That's why we're offering tonight to give away as many of these kits as we get thousand dollar increments in our donations. And all the stuff here, along with your saw, is what's going to enable you to be able to cut that kind of a joint. Anybody can do this. There's nothing special about what I do other than the fact that I've done a lot of it. But I can take somebody brand new and they can produce a joint, a dovetail, in that first attempt that will rival mine. We see it every time we go out and do this. In fact, we usually see it eight or nine times out of every 12 students we have in the class produce that kind of a joint. Now, I want to tell you what else we're going to give away tonight. So, my friend Moose over here, we play hockey together five or six or eight or ten times a week. And <laughs> Moose runs a, 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 Moose is retired from his one career and he operates a, a, a gift shop inside of the oldest market in Canada and sells all kinds of interesting stuff that's unique to the area. And a uh, big supporter of what we do. He has to be a supporter. His dad fought in World War II. And the Lancasters weren't any warmer than the B-52s. So anyway, I asked him, I said, well, what do you got that would be interesting that we, could, that we could draw? And he told me, he said, Rob, he said, we got this one sweater. He said, when kids walk by, they come over and hug it. It's so cozy. And in fact, he said something to me about, he said, it's like holding a cat. Well, that morphed into the dead cat. So now we have what's called the dead cat sweater. And how many people, <laughs> so I go, I can't shut up about something. If I find something I really like, I'm going to tell everybody. So I walk in the dressing room and a bunch of the guys that now wear them because they're so warm. One actually has one just for changing oil on his car. Uh, should, we, uh, should we show the picture of Rob in the dead cat sweater? Sure you can. So this is as cozy as it gets. I'm going to tell you what happened. It was, it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Everybody else had left on a Saturday night and I was cleaning up and it was kind of chilly in here. And there was one of the dead cat sweaters laying there and I went over and it was an extra large and said, that'll fit. And I put it on and I thought, oh, this is incredible. It just, it's the warmest thing I've ever worn. So we're gonna give away a dead cat sweater tonight. And when we draw your name, you'll tell us in the next couple of days what size you want and we'll uh, do our best to get it out to you. So dead cat sweaters up for grabs. And then if you'd like to be the boss, but you can't at home, at least you can wear this when you're away from home. So this is the uh, captain's hoodie. It says, the captain is always right. And then if you notice on the hood, and I'm the captain. And then, uh, I don't want to cause a stampede of calls, but we've had this modeled in here. It's turned out to be very popular. And this is the Naughty Girl shirt, made famous by one Frick Naughty. One and, only naughty. and two of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Poindexter, and who's the other one? It's his glass cutting team. <laughs> so those are three more prizes that we're giving away tonight. All right, question. Uh, sorry, I was in the middle of something. Um, Ali Asawad in the chat says, how do you sharpen the sides of a half-blind half blind dovetail chisel properly? Uh, ha, ha, pronounce his name again? <coughs> Ali Asawad. I, I, I recognize that name. He's a I, I think, From Israel? Free, no. 
Australia. Australia. He's up late. Nick, he's up early. Well, Ali, you don't have to. So the primary function for that side bevel is so that when you're using this to clean out a half blind, have I got one here? You, you recently cut one. When you're cutting out, or when you're cleaning out that half blind, you want to be able to get in. Oh, I, I gotta, shoot, how fast can I do it? Not that fast. Yeah, I can. Just grab a drawer. No, no, I wanna, I wanna actually show them. Let me, uh, oh, let me just, yeah, let me just crank this out real quick. I'm just gonna cut, a, I'm just gonna cut the pin portion so that you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so we would have the dovetail. Um, At least you avoided. The, huh? At least you avoided the end lap on that one. Uh, hey, give me a break. I'm under a lot of pressure here. This, by the way, is called a Kerf X10. And what that does allows you to finish the cut. It's absolutely amazing what it does, but we'll get into that if somebody else uh, asks a question about it. Okay, so there's our end lap. Now we gotta get rid of this material. Whoops, I can't believe I did that on my bench. Oh shoot, I got to uh, mark, I've got to mark on the back of my chisel as a depth gauge so I know how far down I need to go. If you don't, it becomes a very difficult process. So as I get close to that baseline, I've got to take my chisel right to that mark. Now I can put it right in the gauge line and finish it. Okay, now stand this up here and we'll start getting rid of all this material. And if you take multiple small chops like I was doing, those fibers just break, crumble, and it becomes very easy to clean them out. You want to sneak up on that end lap. You don't want to put, if you put your chisel in that gauge line too soon, the pressure on the bevel side may break off that little end lap. So be careful not to do that. Okay, so now I'm trying to get rid of that material in there. You can't do it with a regular chisel because in the process of trying to get into the corner, you see, you can't get into the corner with this, right? Now you could use a very narrow chisel, but even that you're not getting, you're not getting right into the corner. They have what are called skew chisels, and skew chisels have, have, um, I thought I had some here, I don't. Mm -hmm. have our, you have to have two of them, you gotta have a right and a left. No, left. While you're looking, I will show the picture of you in the dead cat sweater. I probably should look at that myself before you show it, but too late. <laughs> yeah. Too late. So, you you go right into the corner like that. But see, this is a, this is the left skew. Then you have to have the opposite chisel so that you can get into the opposite side. Well, instead of that, I have my chisels made so I can get into both corners. And the reason it's beveled on the side is so that I can get in the, underneath those fibers without it getting in the way. Uh, somebody, everybody else that makes them, they leave this side flat. So you're trying to push through and it's very difficult. So that's not actually doing any cutting. It's just allowing, making it easier for the point to slide in there and sever those fibers that are left 
hanging on the side. Now the other advantage to this is it allows my it, it allows me to push with my line of force right in the middle. If you're using a skew chisel, I just had it here. Where'd I put it down? If you're using a skew chisel, you're 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 cutting through end grain, and you're you're pushing with your line of force completely out of whack. Whereas this one allows you to push straight on. So much easier to work. But don't worry about the side. They don't need to be sharp. They're just there as a relief angle. Good question. Next. Okay, next question. Where'd you go? Hey, can you shout? Can we see any other vets come on there? Uh, this one comes from Bob Vogel, Vogel from Illinois. And he hey, Bob. He says, where is the best place to place the drawer bottom groove when you have a through dovetail? Where is the best place to, to place a drawer bottom, drawer bottom groove when you have a through dovetail? So, if I'm following Bob, so there's, there's a drawer where I, instead of half blinds, I have through dovetails. I use it as a decorative feature. So where would I put the groove? Well, what Bob is asking me, I suppose, is that, um, if you cut a groove in here, you'd see it, right? You would actually have a little notch right there showing. So you have to either, if you're going to do it all by hand, it's going to be a little more difficult. If you're doing it by router, you would imagine this being the inside. You would start your router bit right here, and you would go forward. I, I have the option of putting the groove in between the pins. So as long as my groove is somewhere in here, I don't have to worry about it taking out part of the pin. But obviously if it's going to be sitting right here, if I went all the way through, I'd take a notch out of here. So I can either use a router and start right here and go, or I can do it uh, with marking gauges and, and a router plane, which is very tedious but doable. And the other option is that you can use, well, there's actually several other options. One would be you can use what's called a stepped dovetail. Have I got an example here? We just made some. Mm. Where? <clears throat> what did we do it on? No. Yeah, we did on that box. It's right here. The <clears throat> T. <laughs> to hit. Uh, he. We woodworkers. Okay, so here's the other option. We uh, we did this little box. We had some vets down here a couple months ago, and we we did all this by hand. So to avoid showing the groove, we have what's called a step dovetail. So instead of the dovetail line being down here for this one. We moved it up so the groove is sitting right in here, but we were able to eliminate it. So in other words, you take the floor on your pin board, and instead of stopping here, you raise it up. And of course, you have to match it with this. We did that in top and bottom. So here's our groove that we cut, and that groove went all the way through. But instead of it showing down here, because we cut the bottom half of the dovetail off, and we brought up the floor in between the two pins, we're able to hide it. Have we done a video on that? Mm -hmm. We probably need to. Luther, write that one down, would you? We'll do. We'll do one on that. If you're gonna, if you're, especially if you plan on doing everything into everything by hand, that really comes in handy. Okay. So, by the way, how are donations? I hope. What are we giving away? I am uh, working on it. Yes. Okay. Let me know. We had a thousand. We had a thousand dollar donation too. Wow. Yes. Thank and you, somebody. Many, many generous donations from people that are always very generous, like Charlie Ray. Well, you know what? They get it. They get it. And thank you. Next question, Frick. Okay, next question comes from Scott Field in the chat, and he says, why do, toolbo to why do toolbox plans use dovetails on the sides but not on the bottom? Why do toolbox plans use dovetails on the side and not on the bottom? Um, I'm, who, who asked that question? Uh, Scott Field. Scott, 
I, I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure I'm answering this the way you want, but dovetails are always cut on the end of a board, never on the side. So are you asking me why we cut dovetails here, but we don't cut dovetails along here? If that's what you're asking me, please let us know and I will address it. I, I got to make sure I'm, I'm addressing the right question. Next, while we're waiting on that one. Okay. Um, also. By the way, I, I want to give a shout out to my daughter, Erica. Erica provided a meal for all of us tonight. How was it, Moose? How many servings did you have? <laughs> we had to ask him to leave. Very heroic that I only had one. So Erica made what's called Chinese Sundays, which is a Christmas treat that we always have. And then she made uh, apple crisp. Uh, it was delicious. And she works tirelessly. She tolerates Frick, too. Who paid for the ingredients? Who paid for the ingredients? Actually, I think it was you. So. Yes, probably was. Well, for once. <laughs> um, Phil Frick usually gets says up with. hi. Hi, Phil. Merry Christmas, brother. Go ahead, Frick. Next question. All right. Next one comes from Branko Rosanovich. Branko, I haven't, I haven't heard from him in a while. He's in the chat tonight. He's on. And he says, are houndstooth dovetails decorative only, or do they add more strength because of the additional glue service? Good question. They actually add more strength, but not necessarily. Yes, they do add, uh, they add uh, more glue surface, but there's another reason. Have I got a sample? Can you think of anything? Mm. If you, if, in case you don't know what I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I have a houndstooth. Ken, is there a houndstooth dovetail around here? What do you, what are you pointing at? The speaker. Speaker shelves. Oh, yeah. He's tethered. You're not tethered. You are tethered? Not anymore. Oh, come. Okay. So Luca, I'm going to show you what's eyes. called... <laughs> I'm going to show you what's called a uh, half-blind... Uh, a houndstooth dovetail. So if you, you look at... the audio? No. Huh? Not yet. Nope. You see this? Little speaker stand I built? So... Uh, I, got, I need a pointer. Speaker shelf. Speaker shelf. So this is a houndstooth where you have a dovetail inside of a dovetail. And the reason why it adds strength to it, typically what happens is the weakest part of this piece of white wood, let's say this is three inches from here to here, right along the baseline, you've removed that much, this much, this much, and that much. So I'm going to say each one of those is three eighths of an inch. So we have removed an inch and a half of this white wood. And a dovetail gets its strength from long grain to long grain interaction. So if we put in, every time we put in another tail, we further weaken this white piece because we take more wood away from the baseline. But by adding a hound's tooth, you put an additional baseline up here. So I get extra glue surface without weakening it along there. So yes, you get extra glue surface, but you also mechanically gain strength because you don't have to take away more on the main baseline. However, you know what, having said all that, a good dovetail is going to be stronger than, stronger than the wood. And when we, when we break a dovetail, which we frequently do just to show the strength of it, it never fails at the joint. It's always the wood that lets go. Good question. Next. Okay. Are we doing more questions than normal? Am I doing less talking? <laughs> Neither. Uh, next question is... Here we go. Uh, from Dean Rampy in Ang oh actually uh, actually Luther uh, clarified, don't forget he clarified the last one and he you had it right as far as what he was asking you uh, why a groove to hold the bottom instead of dovetails for the thing that you were showing yes yes because we never you never cut dovetails on the long grain side because there's no strength this way then they would just snap off in fact try doing it you will probably break them off when you're assembling them. Dovetails are always cut on the ends of the board. What's Dean Rampey having to say? Hi, Dean. Merry Dean, Christmas, brother. Dean Rampey from Ac Anchorage, Alaska says, Several months ago, you demonstrated a technique where you used the dovetail saw instead of the marking knife to transfer the cut line to the tailboard, uh, on the tailboard to the pinboard. Yeah. Are you no longer teaching this technique? No, no, I still do. It's just this is the problem. Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. Say, say, I, I, I misunderstood. He's say, cutting he's through? Not, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the gymnastics, remember, my average student is in his mid-60s, and some things are just uh, getting a little bit tougher with age. So I, what I used to do is, after setting the tailboard on top of the pinboard, going in and sawing through the tailboard down into the pinboard to start the cut. 
you had to be really careful because you're going through an existing cut and if you put a little bit of sideward pressure on it you're going to chew up the side of your tail i still do it occasionally but i find that it's uh people don't you gotta get really good with your saw and you can do anything but I probably wouldn't recommend that method when you're first starting out just because it requires a really light touch. And here's what happens. Until you train all of the muscles involved in sawing, what happens is you overcompensate what's going on here, out here. And people put a death grip on that saw and it makes it very difficult to have that light touch we're looking for. So until you get to the point where you've done enough sawing that all of this stuff stays and does its job without excessive pressure out here, you're probably gonna have a difficult pro uh, time cutting a joint like that using that technique. I don't think I've ever demonstrated that on YouTube, have we? Yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. Oh, there you go. That was a very distinct answer, Jake. We did a video of it when we were in Niagara Falls, but it was a crappy video. Oh, it was dark. Okay. So yes? Yeah. But yes. No. Next, Frick. All right. Next one comes all the way from Malaysia. From wow. Ming Yu. And Ming Yu, that's his name? Ming yep. and Yu? Yep. Could be female. Ming and Yu? Sure. Yep. I have a problem chiseling softwood when the wood crushes underneath... Uh, when the wood crushes underneath your chisel, how do you deal with that? Ah. Just happen to have the solution. So what you do is you get Jake to grind you a 17 degree chisel. No, now you put your half inch away. There's a uh, there's a 25 degree, which is standard, and there's a 17 degree. So you see how much longer the bevel is. So if you look at the side profile, you'll see. Now. Meng? Is it Meng? Yes. I, uh, I, I used to just drive me crazy. What he's referring to, in case you're unsure, is Chop when chopping uh, softwoods like pine, alder, aspen, basswood, sometimes poplar, the uh, wood has a tendency to want to crush. See if I can get it to do. Of course not. It's a good piece of pine. Cop it would be nice if I could get a cooperative piece of wood. Try this piece. Well, there's a little bit of what happens. The fibers start to crush in there. If you have a 17 degree chisel where the bevel is extremely acute, There's your difference. See that? And what it does, I think, is as your bevel becomes more obtuse, it puts a lot of pressure on the fiber directly ahead of the cutting edge, and that pressure bearing down causes the fibers below it to collapse, and then you get that mess. Whereas if it becomes very acute, that super sharp edge will get down in there and just slice through those fibers. It makes such a huge difference. It's the only thing I've ever found to work, and that's a really good example of how it works. So what we do is we offer, we offer a quarter and a half inch chisel at 17 degrees. Now, you cannot use those chisels in hardwood. You have no recourse with the manufacturer to say, oh, the chisel failed. No, there's just not enough metal behind the cutting edge. These are only for softwoods and only used in softwoods. You have you to have separate chisels. Well, you can, but I mean, you're just, you're, you're, you're risking it because like I said, there's just no wood out there. So we make those, they're on our site. You can, you can buy them. You, you can get by with just a quarter and a half. That'll do. Good question. And uh, somebody could almost accuse you of being a plant. Frick, next. All right. Next one comes from Talbot's Galar. In Westfield, New Jersey. Talbots? And he goes by Tal. Tal. Tal in New Jersey. Merry Christmas. And he says, can you explain the reason why you adjust the spacing of the pins, the width of the saw blade on each side? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we've, do, we've done this uh, 150 times, but I'll do it 151 because um, a lot of people don't get it. 
So, uh, Megan, while I'm getting set up here, is there any more? Are there any more vets that we need to say hello to? Uh, Bill Bailey. We already did. It. Yeah. Well, we're gonna say hello to Bill again. Bill Bailey, Navy Corman, Vietnam. What class was he in? Like 2017? Yeah. Uh, spring. And there's a Bill Edis who's on, and he's a Vietnam vet that did three tours. Three tours in Vietnam. A Matt Olson. Wow. He is coming, or is an applicant. And Dave Weigel, he served in Vietnam. Dave, Merry Christmas. And Matt's coming when? He's an applicant. Well, Matt, I hope to see you this summer. Okay, so what I'm going to... Are you going to cut two here? I'm just... What? Are you going to cut two? Yeah, just... Uh, do, yeah, I'll do a quick one. I'm just going to guess at this. Okay. Neater than super games. Well, that's a... Uh, that's a tough act to follow. So here's my, uh, here's my pin board. I just created my tail board. Now what I would do is take, oh, by the way. So I, I just got a quick little commercial here. This is called the Adjustar. Uh, Jake and I worked on this for how long? Over Seven a year? Years. Seven years? Over Seems a like year. It. Seven years. And thanks yeah. to Paul... Paul's our genius in Ontario that just is, has, he really, I, I, I don't joke when I say genius, he is, uh, it's uncanny how he can come up with, create things, just awesome. We've worked together for a long time. So I've always said why that stinking adjuster knob is so hard to turn. So I had this idea about having a spoked adjuster like this. So we call it the Adjust Star, S-T-A-R. And it's a retrofit on your Wood River. And I've had so many um, people call and tell me, I said, Rob, it was such a game changer because I can now make the adjustment. So here's how it comes. If I can get it open. See that? That fits on. Now, in order to put it on your five and a half, you gotta take the rear toad off. And remember, it's a reverse thread, so you spin it on like that. Take the old one on, put that one on. And uh, we just, this is our third shipment. First two sold out. Am I right? It's a third, isn't it? Yeah. So they're now back in stock. So if you've been waiting for one, the ones for the Lee Nelson planes, we're still having to tweak. They'll be ready, I hope, soon. All right, little side note there. So set my plane on its side. Keep it flush with the top of the plane and lock that in place. Set this back. Now, I normally cut my little rabbit underneath there, but we're going to line that up. So normally what we used to do is we would have removed the waste. Now, I'm going to identify so that you know what the waste is. So that's waste, that's waste, and that's waste. What we used to do is take that out, take a sharp knife and go in there and trace around the tails. Then you would be looking at here and you'd have this really fine line that you're trying to saw to. Well, let me tell you something. As your eyes get older, seeing that line is almost impossible. So I came up with this idea back in 2015. And it was, a, uh, it was something that I had been inspired by a man named Ernest Joyce who wrote a book in 1971 called The Encyclopedia of Furniture Making. And I think that to, even to this day, that is the most complete book on everything hand and power tool related. Not a read cover to cover, but a reference. And he did it this way, but he left out one step that always left me befuddled. So what he would do is he would take his saw, like so, put it in the kerf, drop it down, and drag it through. And he would do all of them, which would give you a mark exactly. There was no wandering in the kerf. It would be an exact mark, and then what you would do is come in, and you would now have to cut on to one side of that mark. The problem was that your saw, because you're having to cut to one side, the saw would want to slide over into it, and you had a kerf mark on the part of the board that you were keeping, meaning the part of the pin. 
So the question is, why do I offset? What I dreamed up in 2015 was, let's, uh, let's actually make this mark a little deeper so we can actually see it. This is, a, this is my dovetail marking knife. Instead of holding on to the saw like that, which is rather difficult because you're grabbing it by the teeth, we had a little blade made that is exactly the same as my dovetail saw, but it's attached to my marking knife handle. So you would put it down in there like that and drag it through. Okay, so here's what you end up with. You see that mark right there. Now I would have to come in and I would have to saw on the left side of that knife mark. And of course my saw is gonna wander and wanna fall into that constantly. Well, I got thinking about that one time and I said, well, if it's in the wrong place, what do we have to do to put it in the right place? Well, see if you can follow me on this. Right now, when I put that in place like that, there's my pen, okay? This piece down here called the pin has to fill the space from this arrow to here, right? From there to there. So it has to fill this piece and the saw curve. If I were to make that mark right in the saw curve, when I put it together, this piece would now be too small by one saw curve, right? Because that point of that arrow is on this side of that knife mark, saw mark, not on that side. So I thought, well, what do you have to do? You simply have to move this top piece over by one saw curve. If you move it over by one saw curve, now you're sawing on the X side, on the waist side of that line, instead of on the, in the pin. See that? So that means this works for the right side of this tail. It works for the right side of this tail. Then to do the opposite, in other words, we're doing this side, we're doing this side. Now to do this side and this side, we have to move it the other way, move it over like that. So it puts your saw curve in the waist instead of in the pin. Let me know if that made, uh, it made, if that made sense. Next, Frick. All right, next question comes from Alan McEwen. Alan, Alan. Alan, yeah. Alan in Ontario? Yes, frequent visitor and viewer. Alan, Merry Christmas, brother. Uh, he says, say we have a lot of drawers or boxes to make, same size. Anytime, we have a lot of drawers or boxes to make. Any, <laughs> any time saving techniques that can be used. Yes, get Ken to make them for you. <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of drawers or boxes to make. Well, so what we would always do, if I was building a chest of drawers and there were nine drawers in there, do every procedure nine times. So I would, I would mark them all out. I would fit all the sides. Then I would mark the ends. I would do every procedure nine times until it actually came to cutting the pins or marking the pins on each one. You can do all those procedures. You can also do what's called gang sawing. I don't, I don't prefer this when it comes to fine furniture because eh, you can, sometimes you can just be off a little bit. So instead of cutting one tail at a time. And laying out one tail at a time. And laying out one tail at a time. You can take two pieces, two drawer sides, lay them out once and come in and cut them at the same time. So essentially one saw cut is doing two tails. Now, the, uh, I just find that it's too easy to accidentally go below your line when you do that. But on, uh, on stuff that maybe isn't furniture grade, by, uh, by all means, and you cut your time in half doing it that way. That, that and just doing the same, it only makes sense that if I've got nine drawers to make, I set my marking gauge once and I use it nine times. So every procedure is only, be, the setup is only going to be done once instead of set up and do the procedure. And then again, set up and do the procedure and do that nine times. So that's a smart way of doing it. Merry Christmas, Alan. Ooh, Alan, uh, Alan's retired uh, university professor. Alan taught um, farming techniques. And he's the one that told me that GMO is not always bad. And here's the example he gave me. 
Good to he be said, taught that? Huh? A what? Nothing. They took, they took uh, one particular plant was resistant to a particular bug. And they were, able to, they were able to somehow GMO another plant so they no longer had to use pesticide for that bug on that particular plant. That's smart. Yes. Chisels. Next. What's wrong with the chisels? Those two. Oh, yes. Okay, Ron well, Miami, as soon as we do this next question. All right, next question is from Simon Rios in Boston. Hey, Simon. He says, is it easier to Go use... Bruins. You're not a fan. I of grew up a Bobby Orr fan. Uh, is it easier to use a coping saw or a chisel when removing material from dovetails? Do you need both? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely coping saw. You get into something like maple or white oak, and you're sitting there banging and thrashing trying to remove that. Oh, my goodness. Ken, what do you think? Fret saw, not a coping saw. He said coping saw. No. Coping saw, pff, no. Fret saw. Fret saw holds the blade much tighter so it doesn't bow on you. And a fret saw, the blade is thin enough that it'll slip down the kerf left by the dovetail saw and allow you to turn within the kerf and go. Can't do that with a, can't do that with a uh, coping saw. Now, what you do is you get as close to the line as possible, and then it's just a couple of quick chops with the chisel and you're done. But I would hate having to go in and remove all my waste with the chisel. Too much work. Now, I want to, to say something. So we just shot a, a YouTube that'll show up sometime next week, and we did it on two chisels. We did a test on the, uh, on the Wood River 3 8 uh, socket chisel, and we did it on the new Narex uh, 3 8 um, tang chisel. Richter. And so Richter. these... Richter? Narex Richter. Narex Richter. So these two chisels... Where are they, Jake? Right here. These two chisels have been done, polished right through to 16,000 grit. So if you'd like to own one of these, and if you know anything about how much work that takes, you'll appreciate it. So we're going to put them up for auction. They're the same size. At the end of the night, the highest bidder gets it. So that's there's the Narex 3 8 and there's the Wood River 3 8 Both are polished, sharp, ready to go. All you got to do is buy it. So just do it in the chat, and then, um, Ken, can you watch for that? Okay, Ken will watch for it. So say, Ken, I bid $4,000. And then, Ken, I bid $4,500. That's where we'll start it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll sign it. Jake and I will both sign the handle and send it to you. you know, take the value down or not. Go ahead, Frick, <laughs> next. All right, next question comes from Granola John in the chat. Granola John. That's all I got. It's his handle. Why are hand-cut dovetails better than those done on a table saw, bandsaw, or router? Well, John, it's all about ownership. And this is what I mean. When I, when I uh, pull out that drawer, that clever little drawer, and somebody looks at somebody, a fellow craftsman, looks at that, and he says, wow, nice dovetails. How'd you do that? Well, I did that with my jig, or I did that with the table saw, or I did that with the bandsaw. None of that has the same effect as if you said, well, I did that with my Rob Cosman dovetail saw. Um, Mrs. Ownership. Claus is on, and she says that she would like to say something. Mrs. Claus would like to say something. She'd this like is Santa to Claus's share wife. Brief. How, how is she going to do it? I don't know. So she's going to... Okay. Well, yeah, we'll wait till she answers that one. Mrs. Claus, the floor is yours. As soon as they get it, I will stop and they'll read it. I'll keep answering questions until it comes through. There's a little bit of a delay from what you hear me to where that comes out. So my answer to my, my sum up to the question you asked is, uh, what I'm all about is teaching skill. That doesn't matter if anybody else cares. At the end of the day, to be able to look at something that you did, David Pye, English craftsman, coined the phrase, workmanship of risk. What it means is the process and the end result are 100% dependent upon your skill. You stick a board in a thickness planer, it comes out the other end thinner, whether you're in the room or not. Try that with a scrub plane, a joiner, and a smoother, where you're taking it from rough and making it that way by hand. Completely different. It only matters to you. It doesn't matter to anybody else. So if, if you're doing this because you enjoy the journey, which is the reason I do it, then you'll understand what I mean. If you just want the end result, buy a jig. But it's all about ownership. 
Workmanship of risk. I love that expression, and I apply it to everything I do. Frick. All right, ready? This one Ma comes. Megan, you interrupt me, okay, whenever it... Okay. This one comes from Aaron Fenn. Hi, Aaron. Uh, frequent visitor and, and watcher of the live episodes. He says, I use Rob's fret saw. When I set it up, the blade bows. Can you show a quick how to yep. install the blade? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. We sometimes let this... Uh, this goes... Uh, I'll actually, I'll set up the one that we're giving away tonight. So here it is. Ken, can you go grab him the needle nose? Little pair of needle nose. I think they're right there on your tool tray, I thought. Okay, so this is important because if you get this wrong, it's really awkward to try to use. <coughs> so when you buy our fret saw, thanks, Ken. What we have done <clears throat> is we've gone in and we've drilled and pinned the handle so it doesn't come off. And then we tape the handle just like Moose tapes the top of his hockey stick. So your power hand and your stick is your, is your dominant hand. It holds the back. That's where all you need all your controls. You need good grip. Same thing here. When I first started using this little fret saw, that handle was so small and smooth, you couldn't get any control. So we just tape it like that, the stick tape. And we sell the stick tape so you can do it on your handles because it also works fantastic on F clamps like that. So, what you're going to do is um, open this up. So you've got you've got one, two, three, four thumb screws on here. You're going to open this up. Inside these jaws, the surfaces are serrated. There's little marks in there. I've got this one tight. I'm going to take one of my blades. The blades come in a little tube, and there's a, there's a pack of twelve. And he, they only come out one way without having to unwind the wire. See if I can guess, get the right one. It would help if I could see. Oh, I did. Okay. Now these blades are, uh, it's very hard to see which way the tooth is running, so just run your thumb along it, and if you feel it grabbing, you're going the right way. Okay, so the, it's designed to cut on the pull stroke, so my, my, I want to have it this way. I feel resistance when I move my hand that way. So tooth out, teeth <coughs> facing me, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that shaft as far down in there as I can. Okay, you want lots of grip. Snug that up, make sure I got it right so I'm feeling resistance so I know it's going to cut when I pull. So loosen the screw, the uh, thumb screw on the frame, and I'm going to put that top one in right to the bottom and snug it up. Okay, so now it's held firmly in place. Now, with this loose, I'm going to pull on this part of the frame, and I'm going to start unwinding this wing nut at the top. And I'm going to unwind it until I get about a quarter of an inch gap right there. And then I'm going to squeeze as tight as I can down here and tighten that wing nut. We'll tighten it against the frame. Now that's not tight enough. So now I can get it singing tight up here. And I'll wind that in maybe all the way, maybe not quite. If I knew anything at all about music, I could tell you what key that is, but I can't even pretend. So now it's nice and tight and it won't bow. However, if you're cutting like that, you're restricted by the depth of the throat. So what we're going to do is we're gonna take a pair of pliers and grab the uh, little blade right there at the, at the clamping point and give it about a 30 degree twist and do the same thing up here with a 30 degree twist. Now what that does is when we're making a horizontal cut, because we've twisted the blade, it's gonna make a horizontal cut when the frame's up here, up above your joint. So you're no longer restricted in the depth of the throat. And that's how you set it up. We give you a dozen blades, if you break one, there's 11 more. You usually break three or four when you first get at it. And then after that, a blade will last you for six months. Good question. Anything from Santa Claus, Mrs. Claus? Not yet. She's probably typing out something. Okay. Would be my guess. Next. Uh, okay. Paul? Paul is, Paul Paul back in, is Paul back in Ottawa? I assume. I think so. Brother Maybe. Paul? Paul's so, back in Canada yet? Yes. No, not yet. I, I would love to tell you the story about Paul. Paul's just a great guy. Lieutenant Commander Paul Morrison, Canadian Navy, just spent a year down in Australia and uh, should be getting his own boat sometime soon. Sorry, ship. He's back in Canada, so welcome home, Paul. Can't wait to show up on our shore. Next. All right. 
from Mikel Miller in Tucson, Arizona. Hi, Mikel. Uh, why would you want the gaps to be small or very thin between the tails? Is there any benefits to it? Why would you want the gaps to be very thin? You mean, oh, okay. Yeah, all right. So what you're referring to are the pins. So when we look at this side of the joint, what, we're, what he's asking me about is these, these little gaps right here. Or the pins is what you're actually seeing. These are the ends of the tails, the dark part. These are the pins. Well, uh, dovetails, for the most part, now are cut with a router bit done on a machine. But a router bit has a limitation. Number one, it's done by machine. Eh, what? That's it's not you. So there's a router bit. You see how narrow it is down here? They can't get much narrower than 3 16 of an inch or else the amount of force on this wide part would snap the bit down here. So they're limited to making this part 3 16 of an inch. I like the look when this is a very, I think it adds a level of finesse that you just don't get with evenly spaced. Now follow me down here and I'll show you what I mean. When I built this, uh, when I built this cabinet, I purposely made the pins and tails a little bit bigger for a reason. So you see how big they are? Quite a bit bigger. And I don't think that has the same fine furniture look that you get from really thin pins. The joint is plenty strong, but I'll end by saying, <coughs> excuse me, that it adds a level of finesse to the joint. Those are too hard to see, but those ones are really tiny. That's why. No other reason. Plenty strong, let me prove it. So here, here's, uh, sorry Eric, I wrecked your joint. There's some really thin pins. This is a piece of poplar and a piece uh, of... Uh, do it on the maple. Piece of poplar and a piece of walnut. And after dinner tonight, I'm probably dressed like this, about 190 pounds. And I can easily stand on that without it breaking. Which means that's not going to come apart or break anytime soon. And that's how come we have antique furniture, because somebody built it right. So don't worry about the little pins. They're always going to be stronger than the application requires. Next. We almost there. What time? Yes. Yeah. What time is it? 58. Is it really? One more question then. When, well, we have to wait for Mrs. Claus to... Yeah, I don't know. She just said that she would... Um, Any more vets saying hello? Ed Did, Lee. Who? Ed Lee, U.S. Army vet. Hi, Ed. Merry Christmas. Hi. Thank hello, you. everyone. Santa's not here, but if possible, I would like to share something brief if, if it is okay. That's all she said. That's all she said. And then Luther asked if she'd like to do calls on video. And I said we can read it if you put it in the comments or if there's another way that you'd like to share it. Let, let me just check my phone real quick to see if it was a message that came through to me. Moose, did you prepare a dance or anything to entertain the folks? Yeah. Well, do the moosey moose. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could show them how I go around you and play <laughs> Let me, uh, let me uh, direct you. So I don't see it on here. Megan, I'm going to ask you just to scroll through there and see if you happen to see it. So here, I'm going to give you a little bit of marital advice. Oh, marital advice. A warm wife is a happy wife, yes? Warm? A warm oh. wife is a happy wife. Mo by, show me my uh, dead cat, please. So if you're wondering what to get for your wife, and I'm not doing this because he's here. I'm doing it because I love this. Get your wife... What? As <laughs> Get your wife a dead cat sweater. It's warm and fluffy on the outside, warm and fluffy on the inside. And she'll just be toasty warm. She will love you forever. You can get it. Go to patsecretgarden.com. That's Moose and his wife, Pat, who, by the way, was in a car accident today. So if you're watching, Pat, we hope you're doing well. Her thoughts and prayers are with you. And go there, check that out, get yourself, it's actually called a, what's it actually called? Quarter, quarter cozy, please. <laughs> Quarters, Nowhere's near listen, near. dead cat is so much better. <laughs> Quarter zip cozy fleece. If you go in the garment section, it's right in the top left-hand corner. But um, trust me, they'll love it. 
All right. Do we hear anything? Last question. No, I should uh, wrap it up, show the prizes one more time. Uh, all right. So here's what we're giving away tonight. A dead cat sweater. Remember, we'll, we'll notify you. You'll let us know what size. What size they come in, Moose? Small, medium, large, extra large. If, if they want small, it's going to be uh, into the new year before we get them. And we have the medium, large, extra large, double X, and triple X. Okay. But the, the quantities are very, very low now. I hear it's a hot item. <laughs> no pun intended. Hot and warm. We're giving away, the captain is always right for that poor guy who doesn't really get to be the boss at home. We're giving away the infamous Naughty Girl t-shirt. And the Naughty Girl is not included. Personally signed by Frick. Sure. And we are giving away the Dovetail Support Kit. Okay. Has a retail value of 500 almost $500. And how many of them are we giving away tonight? Drum roll. Oh. Take a guess. We're at six, nine, three, five. Wow. So sixty-five dollar more donation, and we'll give away seven of these kits tonight. That's a great number. Awesome number. Now, yeah, please. Had a lot of gen very generous. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But please, I want a Christmas present from you, and the Christmas present I want from you is I want you to send Bob and Herman each a Christmas card, please. I'm actually begging you. Send them a card. Write them a little heartfelt note. Put, the, put it in the mail. Look at, look at. Already done here. Be inspired by this. Just imagine the way they're going to feel when they open that up. People love getting mail. It's something that doesn't even happen anymore. But it is this year. Bob and Herman, the addresses are there. Please send it and let me know that you've done it so I can feel good about what you did as well. Thank you. Is yeah. it in? She said Santa was in the military and had several tours in Vietnam. When Rob started the PHP, I never knew how good a feeling he was feeling until I started watching and seeing the effects it had on vets. Yeah. People ask, people thank me all the time, and I just tell them, I say, you know what? It is both an honor and a privilege to be able to do it. It's You cannot describe... Mm. It's on chisels. Oh, yeah, what, what's the chisels? Bill Morrell did 175 for the Wood River, that was the highest, and Scott Field, 140 for the Narek. Okay, so we'll give them, uh, you got two or three minutes if you want to top those bids. Uh, back to what I was trying to say is, um, I, I get to call these guys, I, I think of excuses to, to call them up and just to say hello. They're, they're incredible people. Absolutely incredible people that are dealing with uh, battle scars that uh, never leave them. And the least they can, least we can do is make them feel like we appreciate what they did. The guys that came home from Vietnam, I, my heart bleeds for the what treatment that they received. So make it right. Please make it right. Send them a Christmas card. That's all you got to do. And don't forget to sweeten up your Christmas with some maple products. <laughs> There's always a commercial, right? But that stuff is so good. My boys were raised on it. Fed them nothing but maple butter. That explains it. Yes. It shows you. <laughs> 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 All right. Are we ready for the draw? Oh uh, yeah, Mike, Megan. Did we make our seven? Yes, seven thousand and fifty-five. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, everyone. It. Have Please pray that we'll be able to do our classes. We're planning a special class just for vets within the, our own area because of this COVID thing. And even that's kind of had the, the, its teeth kicked in because uh, of a, a flare-up of COVID. So. And Mrs. Claus says, Rob, we will support your PHP program forever. Our Christmas present to the PHP is $2,000. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Mr. You're awesome. Mrs. Claus. Merry Christmas, Mr. and Mrs. Claus. You don't get near enough credit, but I know that you don't do it for that reason, but you need to know how much I appreciate it and all of these people. Thank you. Okay, Frick. All righty. Let's do our draw. What do we do on first? The, the, uh, let's start with the naughty girl. <coughs> can we pull up a... Most a, coveted can we first. Pull, can we pull up an image from the past? Engraved with, by with, Frick. Frick, Engraved. can we pull up an image from the past with this, when you wore it that night? 
The stars are in the wrong spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, the naughty girl goes to... The naughty girl goes to... Oh, look, Frick Wetmore. Well, that's odd. <laughs> you can't put your name in there. No, I am the naughty girl. John Berardi in Mahopak, New York. John, let us know what size you want for her, and we will have it in the mail. Or you. Or you. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess we... What's the next? Oh, I already drew Not it. that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> the next is... This is a really nice hoodie, too. The captain is always right. Mariner's rule. St. John, New Brunswick. And I am the captain. Who's this going to? This is going to Ferris Wade Butler, MD. Or, uh, Ferris Bueller? No, Ferris Wade. He's got something in, before. In Butler... Is that Maryland? Maryland. Yeah, Maryland, USA. Ferris Wade. Yeah. Ferris, congratulations. Let us know what size. Moose, small, medium, large, extra large, double X large, triple X large. Uh, goes from small to double X. Small to double X. Okay. And the prize of the night. Give me my dead cat. I got to put that on. Please and thank you. Just in case you need instructions, put your arms in there. We're drawing right now. Yes. And stay warm. Winner is... Who gets the dead cat? Davies in Herefordshire, UK. Oh, perfect. You know what? I've taught in England a lot. And when it gets cold and damp over there, the dead cat sweater is a perfect answer. All right. Fix your microphone. Just let it loose. There it is. Okay, so we're giving away seven dovetail support kits. Let's go. Who's the first one going to? The first one is going to Daniel Owen in Tennessee. Daniel Owen in Tennessee. Congratulations, brother. Merry Christmas, too. Next winner. How many of these are we giving away? Seven. Seven. Number two goes to Sylvia. Uh, didn't put her last name. but Frick, for, it's a tough job. Yeah. What's Where? What's it is a hard job. What's MS? Mississippi. Okay, Mississippi. Mississippi. Sylvia in Mississippi. Congratulations. Merry Christmas. Number three goes to Brad Riley in Canada. Brad Riley in Canada. Whereabouts in Canada? Doesn't yes. say. We have an email address. We can look it up. Brad, congratulations and Merry Christmas. Derek Calderwood in Queensland, Australia. Ah, Derek. Down in Queensland, Australia. Merry Derek Christmas. Calderwood. Congratulations. This is number five we're doing. Yep, number five goes to... Wesley Middleton in New York. Wesley in New York. Merry Christmas. Congratulations. Number six. Number six is Matthew Henderson in New Jersey. Matthew Henderson in New Jersey. Congratulations and Merry Christmas. Is this the last one? Well, did was uh, Mrs. Claus on top of the seven, or was it part of the seven? I, I think it would be on top. You would notice a donation for... Well, it might also be he, they, they, Yeah, she sends in a different way, so we'll do two more. Yeah. Okay. So Paul, this is number seven. Yeah, Paul Testoni in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. Paul in East Greenwich, congratulations and Merry Christmas. Number eight. Number eight is Daryl Stewart in Alberta, Canada. Ah, Daryl in Alberta. Merry Christmas and congratulations. And the final one, number nine. Number nine, last but not least, goes to Adam Terrell in North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Matthew? No, Adam. Adam. Terrell. 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 Terrell North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Adam, Merry Christmas. Congratulations. Now, when are we back on? In three weeks? Yeah. Uh, yeah you can do two. Boxing Day. The, what? Two weeks from today is Boxing Day. Are we going to do Canadian, it? Canadian holiday. Why don't we do it? We can do it. I'm Let's busy. do it. No, we're doing it. So Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, we'll be back with our next one. Look forward to it. Merry Christmas, everyone. If I could sing, I would sing Merry Christmas to you, but I can't sing. And thank you for Eric. Th thank you to Eric, er Erica, and Nick. Nick. Good old Gary. Nick's a fantastic woodworker, by the way. You should see some of his work. Nick, website? No Facebook page? Instagram. Instagram page? Okay, come on. What is it? <laughs> NB Wood Finery. NB Wood Finery. Spell that. F-I-N-E-R-Y. E -R -Y. 
Check out Nick's work. You'll be impressed. Moose, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us. And thank Adam Terrell from buying some, for buying something for me, too, because he, he's, he's already shopped. Oh. Early bird gets a worm. Don't forget Pat's well, Secret this Garden. Was, this was a uh, while back. A while back, yeah. Yeah, most knows all those names. Mine like a steel trap. <laughs> PatSecretGarden.com if you want something really unique and something from New Brunswick. Megan, thank you for being here and doing all this figuring and stuff. Everybody here did a Christmas card, right? Ken back there, staying COVID safe. Thank you, Ken, for being here, for all the help. Ken manages our shop. Ken's in charge of production of all the stuff that you get. Thank you to Rex back there. What did you do tonight, Rex? <laughs> Took care of the kids. Took care of the kids. Is that what he's Thank you to us? Rex. Thank you for Jake behind that camera. It's not easy holding that thing for two hours. Yeah, he whines about it all night. Yeah. <laughs> Megan has to rub his back. <laughs> and <laughs> since nothing happened tonight, big high five to Frick for pulling it off. Anybody got hand sanitizer? <laughs> <laughs> Please have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Remember the reason for the season. Enjoy your family as best you can. Please, please give me a Christmas present and send a Christmas card to both Bob and to Herman. You will make my year more than anything else. And let us know that you've done it so that we can feel really good about it and we don't have to sit around wondering. See you in two weeks. Good night.